Amda Day to celebrate wins. Walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and his life. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Why don't we sing together? They, Wynn and Jenny and the family have been singing and worshipping and crying and laughing over the last few days. But one of the things that Wynn really enjoyed is he sat in his chair, which is empty today. Thank you for that. And uh, I could look and look up to where he sat. He would always enjoy the worship. And so, come on, let's sing together today. And I invite you now to stand as we sing uh, two songs that you will know perhaps or maybe learn with us, Majesty and, or He is Lord and Majesty. Let's stand together, shall we?
Father, we stand before you today and we thank you and we worship you. We thank you that you are enthroned in the praises of your people. And today, as we remember our friend and remember his walk with you, we praise you and we glorify you and we commit our ways to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. In the service of celebration and remembrance, we, um, we, uh, I'm going to call on uh, a number of people and, uh, and they're ready to share uh, some of their journey with Wynn and help us in that way. It's so great to uh, have uh, Kamatu uh, Joe Tupui uh, from Waikato now, but um, was down here when uh, Dale and I first came to Invercargill many years ago. And uh, I count Joe as a friend. It's been a great delight. Uh, for me to be able to uh, connect with him again, uh, even at the sad time. But uh, Joe, if you would come, I'd really appreciate that and uh, share with us today. Thank you so much. Kiaro the Tino Koro at Atene, Tupuna, Fakamone, Yarato, Kina Koro, or the King Yehoromona, Kotawehi Kia Ihoa, the Timatanga, the Fakarone, and Mihiko and Akia Koto, the Fakahonore, the King Maori, and the Hone Runga Tahu de Watapu and a Matu on a Tupuna, in a Itawai, Fakatungi and Ne, the King Itanga, the Fakaya Ne, Naiwe Katuo to Motu. And he had to kill Koto, no red tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. Koretato, what it would cheer Nara, Nato, Fateko, and no hone ton of fire, Tiariki nui, Tati rangi kahu, Kerunga, Te ahu de watapu, and a matua, Tupuna, Murimai, Nara rangi kingi, Hingonga, na tetikura, Aramaira to hate ya, Pai Maririkia ratu kato. Red me here to kill coat to ten a coat to eat two tefare. Ten a coat to fare. A Korea, what a cheer. Now to a no neo, get hot over Murihu. Time my neo, get ten a fare, herapua, the hura he ticker, the hura he pie, the hura he kitty oranga, oranga tone, the hura he or tatane, a riki, a ukrite. No red a mihi nui kiaque. Mihiatu kina na kroa na kuia na hoa o mua ko wehiatu ki te arai. I mua e tātou nei rangatira. Koutou ki a koutou, tātou ki a tātou tēnā koutou katoa. It's customary we acknowledge our Creator. It's customary that uh, not only because I hail from Waikato, but because uh, we are the servants of the Kingitanga, that we acknowledge the Māori King in remembrance of that great decision that many of our ancestors made and all the waka when they came together to establish the king movement. And in that, we also acknowledge the 40 years of Te Ati Rangikahu, the Māori Queen, a passionate follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we know about the blessings of the 40 years throughout scripture. And so we acknowledge her and we acknowledge her son who sits on the throne. I acknowledge all of you Nā waka katoa, e mihi atu ki a koutou te kōwharau a tai tokarau, tēnā koutou katoa, ko tēnei a koutou nei taonga, mihi nui ki a koutou, ki nā whare tapu, ki te whare tapu a nāpui i tēnā koe, <coughs> pihanga tōhoro titiro ki te ramaro, te ramaro titiro ki whiria, ko te paiaka, ko te riri, ko te kaua rāiri, whiria titiro ki pangaru ki pāpata, te rākau tū pāpata, e tū ke te hauauru. <coughs> Pangaru titiro ki maunga tanifa. Maunga tanifa titiro ki tokarau e noho nei. Tokarau titiro ki te rākau mangamanga. Te rākau mangamanga 
titiro ki manaya ko te parafau tēnā. Manaya titiro ki tūtā mui ke rera nga uri o hau ko nga ati whātua e noho ana. <coughs> tūtā mui titiro ki maunga nui, maunga nui titiro ki te rua hoki anga ke rera nga tani whae rua ki a niwa rawa ko arai tūru, ke rera whaka, whakatere whakarungo rua, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou, tai atu ki te rārawa, tai atu anō ki te ao pauri, e kore tātou e wareware tia, te hononga tanga, a rei tū, rau ko rei pai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. The knowledge that uh, as wind hails from the north, that I name those wonderful ancestral mountains that make up the sacred house of the tribes of the north and acknowledge his beginnings and acknowledge his ancestry and acknowledge his whakapapa and through his marriage here that through his children he's connected the far north to the far south as far south as this country can go the whakapapa is connected through this man and his, uh, and his wives and his children. I want to uh, share from Wynne's Bible. I have the privilege of uh, opening his Bible. And I think every sermon that uh, Ian Wright ever, ever preached on this thing got a commentary. <laughs> yeah, they're very good commentaries. Yeah, 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 they are. Love you, my friend. Good to see you again. I wondered what to, what to say when I, I arrived here and I was asked to stand and uh, given the privilege of sharing today because there's so much you can share and I'm um, very conscious that behind me that, uh, that there, there is a great lineup of people who want to share and so I've made sure I stick to Taas Oti because by far you have uh, got the, the, the greatest job here and so I acknowledge um, you know, the Bible says we have a great cloud of witnesses. The Apostle Paul says we've got a great cloud. We can't see them, but they're there. And we've got a wonderful allegory to this in live streaming because people are watching. They are witnesses. We can't see them, but you know and I know around the, around the, around the globe, people are watching us. And so we acknowledge the great cloud of witnesses. And so uh, with that, uh, the, with the, in, in, in uh, respect to that technology, I just want to acknowledge Julian, who for reasons cannot be here. And uh, tried very hard for the family, tried very hard for Julian to be able to see this live, and, uh, and that hasn't been able to happen, but he will see a delayed commentary of it. And so, Julian, just want to say the family love you. And your father, like Hezekiah, was asked to get his house in order because you're about to die and uh, a very important part of getting his house in order was to say he loved you and reconcile himself to you, Julian. And uh, reconcile himself to the rest of his family. Your older brother will take, pick that up, no doubt, as we go through. I want to talk about something that does win credit. And... Uh, we can do anything, uh, say anything here. This is a man that we don't have to make stories. I've been to funerals and so have you where stories uh, have uh, had to be exaggerated. And we've sat in those times and those funerals and think, well, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, we can buy that. We can, tēnākwe, Shirley. And um, the stories have had to be exaggerated. We don't have to exaggerate those stories here. We've had some wonderful ministry at the house. And people have talked about um, Wynne's uh, interesting, uh, in interesting whaikōrero on the marae. And people have talked about the carrots and the urging to, uh, to change our diets. And I've really got to resist the temptation to say, you know, you people are stupid. The food is killing you. And so I really, really need to put that aside. But how can we honour Wynne today? And how can I honour Wynne? And Māori uh, Wynne is on a journey. After the last final karakia, he's been here with us. He hasn't departed. And I've shared it at the house twice already, and I share it here. The parallel to that, in Māori Dham, we believe that they linger until the final karakia. And at the end of the service, 
His spirit will depart. It will go on its journey. And then it's up to us to take his mortal remains and return them to the earth, return them to Papa Tuanuku. And the only parallel I could find, of course, is Jesus, after the wonderful work of the cross, sitting at the tomb. Mary wants to run up and hug him. He says, you cannot touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. And there was something about that that's, that's a lot deeper than I've ever studied. And uh, as I get older, I'll, I'll, I'll do, some, do some more study on it, and the uh, Holy Spirit will open that up to me. But uh, clearly, he was not part of the living world, but he had not yet gone to his destination. And so we believe uh, that he is still here. In Māori, we believe that uh, when that final karakia is said here today, that he will start his journey. Kia mau i eia, nga parero o nga kahurangi. Kia heki iho ki na te 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 o nga maunga, mai takitimu, ki aora ki, ti tiro kauana ki nga whenua o te waipauna mu hoki. Hare tone ia, ki te tāho poka poka ka tāwhaki. Hare tone ia, ki rimu taka, ki te tararua. Hare tone ia, ki nga kahui maunga o tongariro. Whakawhiti atu rā ki te tai rāwhiti ki hikurangi e mihi ana ki nga tini kauma, nga tini whanaunga o reira. Tahuri mai anō ki te hauāru, ki te maunga titu hia a Taranaki. Hare tonu ia ki nga maunga pare waikoto, pare hauraki. E noho nei ke runga te tihi o taupuri e mihi atu ki a pirongia. Mai i reira a reitu rawa ko rei pai. Haere tonu ia, tahuri atu ki mauau, ki tauranga moana, ke reira anō nga tini whanaunga o tona whanau. Me hui a hui, me haere tonu ia, ki nga te pai roa a taramai nuku. Ki te aroha, ke reira te takotoranga a tamata kapua. Haere tonu ia, ki te whare tapu a nāpuhi, ki era o nga maunga. He will traverse all those mountains and he will look upon the land and, the, and visit the places that he, he, it were dear to him in his lifetime. And eventually he will get to the place, the And uh, But before we send them off, I'm encouraged to share this word in honor of my friend. And the word is about Lazarus and the rich man. And I asked you, to bear with me. You mark all these pages and then it's always hard when you've got somebody else's Bible and things don't quite read the same. I'm sure that doesn't read the same. I think this fellow Weetana Murray changed the word. He's reprinted it. <laughs> and, uh, but in the book of, about Lazarus, I'll tell you the story. And we've got enough We've got enough people who know scripture where, where I may omit something, then we are in safe hands, and especially in safe hands with the pastors of this church. There was a rich man, and he lived there in his house, and he was uh, very wealthy, extremely wealthy. And uh, outside his gate lived a very poor man. You know, we go to, I go to India with, uh, with my mate Bob, Bob and Shirley, and you see that. You'll see pohara people living on the dirt, tin shack, a couple of tin uh, sheets of, of, for a roof, stacked up against a mansion. And the mansion's got, uh, got a satellite, three satellite beams, and you see the extremely wealthy in the extreme poverty living side by side. And that's the picture the scripture is trying to paint here. It exists in this country as well, but we'll, we'll talk about that another time. <coughs> And of course, the rich man every day, he's coming out with his chauffeur-driven car and he's reading his uh, Wall Street Times and he can't see the need around him. This is not about rich people, by the way. This country is blessed with many wonderful, God-fearing, rich people. I think of the J.R. McKenzie Trust, wonderful family trust, philanthropic trust. I think of the D.V. Bryan Trust. I think of Sir Robert Laidlaw, the founder of the Farmers Trading Company, 
wonderful people. You know, after the war, uh, the, the sort of commodity items they were coming in, fridges and things like that, were only for wealthy people. And Sir Robert Laidlaw set up the, the farmer's trading company. He brought in something that um, time payment. He was the first person to bet, the, the Americans borrowed it after. And it meant that working class people could have these commodity items. Wonderful man. You know, it's written about his life that when he went through, he was um, living off the 90% of his income and donating the, the 10%. Towards the end of his life, he was so wealthy, he was living off the 10% and giving the 90. Sir Robert Laidlaw, great Scotsman, great New Zealander. And so this is not about wealthy people. This could be about you and I. And so we heard stories about wind, seeing need around them and doing random acts of, of, uh, of, uh, of charity, driven by the Holy Spirit. And so every day this rich man is coming and going and he cannot see the need. And one day, uh, of course, Lazarus dies and Jesus is talking to Jewish people. So he's talking to them in their, con in, uh, in their knowledge about what they know about the hereafter. And so he's uh, addressing sinners and publicans. I just had to have a check this morning and it just crossed my mind to say, well, who was he addressing when he, when he, when he, when he did this? And so I rung a couple of friends and he said, oh, go back to verse 15 and, and you'll see who he was talking to. He was talking to sinners and publicans and, of course, the Pharisees and the scribes were in the wings criticizing his... Uh, his uh, his uh, conversation with them. And so in the end, he tells the story about Lazarus and the rich man. You see, in Māori, then we've got a very simple theology about, around, around, around death in Māori. There's only two dimensions. Āpiti hono tātai hono, rātou ki a rātou. Āpiti hono tātai hono, tātou ki a tātou. There's them and there's us. And... Uh, people who try to act as mediums in between are treading on dangerous ground. And so Jesus tells this story because the Hebrew people, like many ancient color, cultures, have an understanding of the underworld. They have an understanding of another gathering place of the dead. And so Lazarus goes and he goes to the bosom of his tupuna, Abraham. <coughs> and they have an understanding that the righteous will go to the bosom of their tupuna, Abraham, until the arrival of the Messiah and the resurrection. That's the, the thinking. And the other man, the rich man when he died, he went to another place. So suddenly our two-dimensional world is getting a bit confused because on the other side, there's a third dimension. There's another place. And there, in that terrible place, the rich man, with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and torment, he looks up across and he sees Father Abraham, that must add to his torment as well, by the way, and he sees Lazarus in his arms, in his bosom, and he said, Father Abraham, can you get me out of this place? And in the Hebrew, when you read the Hebrew, Abraham's answer, Abraham said, look, we cannot. He cannot, we cannot come to you. You cannot come to us. There is a chasm between us. And in the Maori, Whakaro, Apiti hono tātai hono koto ki koto. We can't come to you. Apiti hono tātai hono Tato ki a tato. I was really inspired about this. I was thinking about it the other night. Should I, you know, it's not easy to talk about hell at a place like this because you, you run into the territory that you're trying to use scare tactics. We all know scare tactics don't work. We know those ugly cancerous photos on cigarette packets don't work. We know that uh, the consequences of uh, foolish actions don't work. I was reading about that family over, over Christmas, went out at the Hutt River to pull up a net in a dinghy with no, seat, well, no life jackets, choppy sea. Anybody who's been out to pull up a net, you know there are some terrible dangers there. 
and all the warnings about that sort of stuff don't work. And I sort of wondered, should I share something about hell at a time like this? And what inspired I looked for, I looked for some confirmation that it was the right word. And my mate Tana Cooper the other night said, boy, this fellow, he's gone to a better place. I wish he could come back and tell us. I wish he could come back. And I took that as a rima. I said, yep, that's a confirmation that this is the right word. And I've just got to treat it with delicacy, uh, very delicately rather, and I've just got to be very, very careful about how I weave through it because this is not a word to try and scare people into the kingdom. If you can be manipulated in, you can be manipulated out. If you can be scared in, you can be scared out. Is it, is it seen, I've been a Christian long enough to see enough of that. And so the rich man, he asked another question. He said, Father Abraham, can you get Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and bring it to me and quench my thirst? Now that's the finger that was covered in haki haki and the dogs used to lick and, and even the dogs had compassion on this man. But the rich man never saw him. And then Abraham said, can't do that. And so the rich man had an opportunity to contemplate his life and contemplate eternity. I once, uh, as a very young man, um, lying in my bed after a hard night out at Bluff, one of, the, one of the hotels in Bluff, probably the one that was still allowed to let me in there, and um, I woke up in the morning and, and houses that live like that and families that live like that have a ritual the next morning. And so I can hear my wife bashing pots and pans in the, in the kitchen. And it's all getting set up for an encounter about all the things I promised and, uh, and the hole in the pay packet and all that. And I'm lying there dreading, uh, not again. And then of all people was Gary McCormick was on the, f on the radio. So I'm listening to Gary McCormick and he's talking about eternity. And he said, try and imagine a steel stainless steel ball, the size of a house, floating out in space, uncorruptible. And every thousand years, an eagle comes down, brushes its wing over the ball, and goes back to its perch. And then a thousand years later, it comes down, brushes his wings over the ball, and goes back to its perch. And he went on and on. He said, now try and imagine that that is eternity the eternity is the day the eagle wears the ball out. And he said, if you can get your head around that, then try and imagine that the day the eagle wears out that ball is but one day in eternity. And I was thinking, man, that's a, that is a very, very long time. And just deep, it's one of those moments in our lives when you're searching and you know you're not in a good place. And just one of those moments where a rima comes and starts challenging your thoughts about life. And finally, the rich man said, Father Abraham, he comes up with an idea. It was the idea that Tana Cooper inspired me with the other night. He said, Father Abraham, can you send Lazarus back? My brothers are partying up. They've got no idea of this place. Can you send Lazarus Black to warn them? And Father Abraham said they had the prophets. And if they did not believe the prophets, they will not believe even if one should come back from the dead. It was prophetic, of course, about, about what, was to, what was to happen. This is Jesus telling the story. We know when has gone to a better place. We know through his faith in the Lord to have a Christian faith is to be fundamentally secure in every possible way that because of his faith in the Lord he has inherited a better place, better even than the bosom of Abraham. The thief on the cross, Jesus simply turned to him. One thief said, if you are the Messiah, get us out of here. The other thief said, leave him alone. We deserve to be here. We are thieves. But this man has done nothing. Lord, remember me when you come into your glory. And Jesus' immediate answer said, Today. 
Today you will be with me in paradise. Today we turn up. You go to paradise. Ore tenei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Joe. Um, so great to have the word broken open and the freshness, it's like bread. And, um, and so faith rises in our hearts. Thank you so much. Wynne would have enjoyed that. I can see him up the back there just uh, giving a wee nod right now. You did okay. And it's great to have you down here in the south again. I I'm going to ask, uh, before we sing again, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Kiriyama if, uh, if you would come for a moment and, uh, and just share as well. And then we're going to sing another song, and then we've got another couple of speakers. And so uh, Kiriyama, who led us in the haka before and who's been uh, in the house and with the tangi and with the family in Fano uh, for these last few days, great friend of this house and, of course, wins as well. Kiriyama. really hard not to cry ha. but this man impacted on my life and he touched my heart a few days ago singing together, laughing and celebrating his birthday. It was a glorious day. And today is a glorious day. We salute you, Matua. We celebrate your life together. 
two people. And the one God. And we thank you, Father. Our spiritual Father. We call him Father. I call him Dad. I thank him. For everything he shared with me. He shared, he shared his heart with me. He shared his hurts with me. His pains. His darkest secrets. And I remember sitting there listening to the stories and thinking, wow, that's intense. But it's taken me a long time to realize that what he was doing was trying to protect me from making maybe the same mistakes as he did. But I used to sit there and wonder, how does a man come from certain situations where he's been so hurt to a freedom that just released this love and aroha to every single person he came into contact with. And he told me about the time where he changed and he decided that he wasn't going to be feeling sorry for himself anymore. He told me about his faith over and over again but his greatest witness for me was the way he lived. And I never knew him before he came to the Lord, but his life just ref reflected love. And through his life, drew me closer to the Lord. By the way, I wasn't going to use that patu on anybody. So. There's a, a Pakatoki, a proverb which says, Rurea taitia kia tu ko tai kaka anake. Strip away the bark and expose the heartwood. The Bible says, as the face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the person. And I used to ponder and wonder what those meant. What did that mean? And for me, this man stripped away the, the staunch, tough exterior. And he shared his heart with me. He shared his love with me, his hurts, his, his passions, his desires. And he reflected love in my eyes. He reflected a man, a strong Cody tree, and he was, he was a person who was a rock. A Māori proverb says, he took a tūmona a anga tai, a rock that's, that withstands the tide and the oceans. He was always there for me. And I shared some stories the other night how it was amazing. He amazed me. There was a period there where I had sort of fallen away from, from the Lord and he would just turn up out of the blue. I would be thinking, wow, I was about to go and party. Okay, thank you, Matua. Um, hmm. And he just had this way of turning up, turning up and surprising me and it was, it was lovely. There was times where my heart was broken and you just show up. Hey, bro, come over and eat some kinners. Like, yeah. <laughs> Nelson Mandela said this. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we, we lead. And I think that reflects this man's heart. He lived and he loved unconditionally. 
He loved the Lord. But he was still stubborn. And many times in my life, that's exactly what I've needed. You just tell me black and white. Etama. You need to do this, you need to do that. Okay. Okay. But I rejoice. I rejoice in the Lord. I know where, where my father is. I know where he is. And I see his face again, smiling. Just like that photo of him. That cheeky little grinny head. I, um, just as I was walking in earlier, I just had a quick glimpse of um, Matua Wynn and Pastor Dale wrestling and thinking to myself, oh, okay, not sure how that works, but 2 Corinthians 4.16 to 18 says, Therefore we do not lose hope, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He was a part of my father. Fano, a link to our past, a bridge to our future. Fano, a never apart, maybe in distance, but not in heart. Fano, may not have it all together, but together we have it all. Fano, shares your past, shapes your future, and loves you for who you are. Other things may change, but we start and end with Fano. Fano are like the branches on a tree. We all grow in different directions, yet our roots remain as one. Reira, e taranga tira, te tōtara haumata, te toka tūmoana. Hare atu rā, te tonga ringa ringa, te atua. Hare atu rā kia, ki o mātua tūpuna. Go into the arms of the Lord. Go back to your loved ones, your ancestors. One day, we'll meet again. It's going to be a glorious day. It's going to be plenty of kina, Lots of music. Just wanted to finish with this. From Nelson Mandela again. And um, it's just a poem which says, I've walked a long road to freedom. But I've discovered that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I've taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of this vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I've come, but only rest for a moment. But with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger. My long walk is not yet ended. Finish with this um, proverb, Fakatoki, which says, Kia hora te marino, Fakapapa pauna mi te moana, Kia tere te karohi rohi, Mua to huarahi. May the calm be widespread, May the oceans forever glisten like our green stone, May the Lord's sunlight forever dance upon your pathway, each of every one of you, until we meet again. Vera Matua will love you, will always be in our heart, and we'll see you again. Kia ora whana. We're going to share a song now.
Kiriyama, thank you. Um, I have still to get the revelation that kinna is food of heaven. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Why don't we stand together and we're going to sing um, another song. And uh, Wynne really wanted to have this when him and Ginny got married. Um, and the song is called uh, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. But she wouldn't let him. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, but today he gets his wish. Is that okay? So uh, come on, let's fill our lungs uh, with air and, uh, and with aroha and uh, let's sing together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.
wedding song. Please be seated. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, uh, Virginia's brother, um, Graham, to come and just share his thoughts and family thoughts uh, around Wynn. Graham Morton, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's moments like these. I wish I had to go on, gone along to Toastmasters with Wynn. Um, uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank all the friends and family that have been helping out over the last few days with food and odd jobs. I'd also like to thank my friends uh, Darren and Warren for the offer of help. So if you'd like to come up now and read this for me, by all means, come on up. Uh, I'd also like to help uh, thank the church for everything that they've done um, for us. Right. I've known Wynne for over 20 years, and like me, if you knew Wynne, you would know what a special man he really was and how he made an impression on everyone he met. <coughs> this is going to be hard. Deep breaths. It amazed me the big impact he had on people after meeting them for only a short time. Wynne loved people. He loved his dog. Um, Wynne never talked about anyone behind their backs. My sister said often they wish he did, because if he had a problem, he told them to their face, obviously. I liked him about, I, I liked that about him. Um, you knew where you were with him. Wynne was a very generous person. Um, he worked in the prison, spreading the, uh, the Christian word amongst the prisoners. He was right into his hallelujah acres, healthy eating, and would help sick people by educating them and um, making salads and juices. Wynne painted, cleared sections, mowed lawns, cooked meals, did dishes, and never, ex and never expected anything back in return. Nothing was a problem. I remember the following stories. Wynne was born in Kaitaia, where he was brought up by his grandparents. He had a very happy childhood and school life and traded his smoke deal for sandwiches from the European students. They used to ride, I think this is really funny, they used to ride horses to school. After school they just jumped on the first horse that came by. So when they got home they just slapped the horse on the rump and they took off. So at four o'clock around town you'd see all these horses trying to find their way home. Wynne spoke of this marvellous big river that they used to dive into, uh, swim in, and dam. When Ginny visited recently, it was only a small ditch, much to Wynne's amazement. You thought it had shrunk. Wynne's grandparents would go gum digging, and Wynne would be left with his aunts and uncles, but he would go straight back home, meaning he stayed on his own at a very young age. You'd probably get arrested for that now. My sister Ginny met Wynne at a friend's barbecue. They, sp they spent 12 years as friends. We never quite knew what was going on, but were heartened to know that they didn't either. <laughs> Wynne's proposal to Ginny went something like this. He called Ginny on her birthday and played, If You Don't Know Me By Now. However, according to Ginny, there was no official proposal. She just assumed that's what he meant. So lucky she got it right. I can remember when Ginny told us she was engaged. We were at the Lone Star for her birthday dinner. Wynne wasn't there for some reason. Uh, anyhow, someone casually asked Ginny what she had planned for the year ahead. To which she replied, I think I just got engaged, so I guess I'm getting married. To which I replied like a complete idiot, saying, You what? To who? When? <laughs> we always wondered if they were going to get married, but nothing was ever said, so this was a complete shock. I think Ginny's forgiven me now. Um, the wedding was wonderful. The only hiccup was that it was on the same time as an all-black test. This was something that was a right muck-up. Because when the Mortons do something, it should fit around the all-blacks. Something I might add, uh, my wife has struggled with for many years. Ken Hoff Hufferdine, who we grew up with, was master of ceremonies, had brought a heap of small radios um, that we could listen to the game, and he dressed up as a referee. 
It was a great touch and many laughs were had. Turn the page. Wynne fitted easily into our family. We loved him dearly. We would have prolonged talks about Māoridom, politics, and Cheryl and my wife had in-depth talks on health. This was something Wynne was passionate about, and so was my wife, but they used to giggle away as they tried to get their points across. There was never harsh words or hard feelings. Wynne loved my children, and they loved him. Deep breaths again. He taught my children the benefits of eating vegetables and salads. We thought this was great until we couldn't get them to eat meat because Uncle Wynne said it was bad for them. <laughs> he also taught my son Taylor, who was around seven at the time, to eat fish eyes and kinna. Yuck. No, I'm hearing you. Uh, my parents, Marie and Jock, would say that we're so lucky to have one. He's a staunch man of God and loved my sister dearly and made her happy deep breaths. <laughs> That's all we could have asked for, eh? Um, we liked how they had their special traditions. Um, one being <clears throat> after church on Sunday they would head out to the beach house in Riverton for lunch together. <clears throat> That hasn't made it any easier. <laughs> <laughs> Before signing off, I'd like to read a few words from a, my children wrote of what meant, Wynne meant to them. Grayson, I will miss Wynne because he made nice food and let me come to his place for tea. Wynne was funny to be around and I loved going on holidays with him. He was never angry or unfair and always helped me when he could. Taylor. I remember one because he made us healthy. <laughs> we couldn't do that, obviously. I really like the real fruit ice creams. He always looked out for us. Bridie. Um, now, Bridie and Wynne had special names for each other. Plonker. Wynne was Big Plonker, and Bridie was Wee or Bubba Plonker. I think Audie's now taken over that name um, after the last week. She wrote, My Uncle Wynne was so special to me, he, always, he was always full of joy and love. I'll never forget him. It's been a special time too, I must say this, guys. It's been a special time over the last while with all Wynne's children and families. We look forward to visits when you're over. <clears throat> I would like to say in closing, Wynne had so much to live for. A loving wife and children. He struggled so hard, but he didn't lose. He's up in heaven, up to his eyebrows in kinners, fish heads, and of course carrots. When it's time to say au revoir, which in French means till we meet again. See you soon, brother. And from the Mortons, thank you so much for the love and joy you brought us. Love you heaps and miss you dearly. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, I was sitting there reflecting on the health food. I remember I was quite ill and um, I, uh, I asked Wynne for some help and so gave me a bottle of something and um, there was no instructions. It was actually a Coke bottle but that didn't help either because it definitely wasn't coke and he said I want you to drink it all at once and uh, I said that's a big ask you know he said no you'll be fine and uh, so I took it away with me and I was in a motel in Timaru I'll never forget it and I was really ill and um, I didn't know what the matter with me so I drank this whole bottle and about a quarter of an hour later I was so violently ill <laughs> I just could not stop you know, I don't want to go into it because some of you here are you know imaginary people and but you know when you get peas and carrots and everything and, and it's just, and, and corn, what is the with corn? And, um, and so I rang him, I was like angry because I was, this thing was poisoning me. And, he, and I said, what, what did you give me? And because uh, he said, what did it do? And I said, well, I explained what it did. And he said, well, that's what it's supposed to do. 
He said, how do you feel now? I said, angry. <laughs> but well. He said, good. So when you come back, I'll give you something else and it'll help. But I went, I don't want to touch that stuff ever again. So it's like you can keep your carrot juice. But anyway, whatever that was. But I want to invite, I want to invite my wife up. My wife and Wynne had a really special relationship. And um, Dale is one of the pastors here at the Christian Centre. Come on up, honey. And she's the, definitely the best looking one. And, um, and so uh, uh, to the other day when we said our farewells to Wynne, and, and uh, just before he passed, I remember I leaned over and I, I blessed him, I kissed him on the forehead, and there wasn't much reaction. And then Dale just followed suit and she kissed him, and he grinned, which was really annoying. Um, <laughs> Um, and then we made a joke about that, and you could see he just enjoyed that moment as well, and, and we loved him. And Dale loved him so much too, and uh, she's going to share a little bit about that journey with him. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It's true. Wynne and I did have a kind of unique relationship in this place. And it was one that had kind of built and become more and more dis demonstrative over time. And it was one that was quite obvious to other people that were around. Kiriyama, you mentioned it before. And, and reflecting and thinking about when. And I was just trying to think, actually, how did that all start? And I think in retrospect, it was when I first got to know when, and he was talking about his health and his drinks, and I'm, as a nurse, I'm really interested in health too. And so him and I would spend time together and he would tell me all about his diet. And yes, we drank gallons of that mushroom-like soup, you know, that drink that he had, which actually was quite nice. And, and he shared a number of recipes with me and I really enjoyed that. And, how, and I even considered at one point of kind of doing the Hallelujah diet kind of full time, but after a couple of days I was always freezing. I thought, no way, I'm not going to do that. But one thing about Wynne, he was a man who stood by his convictions. And even though we would have uh, spread church functions where there was lots of food around, that we would just look at them and he would turn up his nose and he'd go, oh, I'm not going to eat that stuff. You know, he didn't not come because of the food was not to his liking. And he would sidle up next to me at the table and he would just bump my shoulder and he'd go, are you going to eat that stuff? <laughs> so I'd pick up a carrot stick and say, yeah, I'm going to eat this. And then I'd probably pick up something sweet just to stir him up. And so he would just, you know, he, I think that's where it started. He would just bump alongside me. And he would just lift his eyebrows and lift up his flask of carrot juice. You know, like raise up the carrot just like, good on you, Wynne, you're amazing. Love you. Well, they're bumping up against one another, kind of progressed over time. And, you know, I've got brothers. I've got two brothers. There's no girls in my family. And I've had three sons. And I know that when guys bump up and they shove you and they push you and they laugh at you and make jokes about you, it's men speak for really liking you. You know, they may lack the capacity to actually vocalise it well, but what he was really saying, actually, I like you. And I took it as a compliment, and I responded in kind. And you've heard the term, perhaps, the escalation of retaliation. Well, it kind of escalated. And I'd be kind of, you know, it just got to actually quite a good hard shove. And I might be talking to some visitors in the house, you know, during a Sunday service, and you know, introducing myself and being formal, and along come when, and he would go, mm, in the middle of my talk, and he would just carry on. He'd put his nose in the air and carry on. And the people that I'm talking with would look at me, and I'd go, oh, don't worry about him. That's Wynne. He's just got issues. But really, he's harmless. He's all right. And, you know, and, you know because he got quite forceful, and his response is, I'm, look, I'm up for a challenge. You know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So I would respond in kind. And I'd walk past him and I'd give him a good shove and just push and carry on. And many of you who are perhaps part of this place may have seen that. And I'm quite sure he said to people, oh, that's Dale. 
She's one of the senior pastors. You don't want to cross her, mate. She will give you, make you, give you problems. And so we carried on. And it just kind of escalated to the point where we really would wrestle. One time he got me, because I was talking with someone, and you don't expect to be shoved from behind when you're doing that. And he actually got me off bounce. I fell on the floor. I thought, when? And his wife told him off. He was much better after you married him, Ginny. Honestly, his wife told him, but I don't think he listened one iota because it just kept carrying on. After he had his hip surgery, it became a bit more circumspect. And so, you know, I, I would probably shove him if he was sitting up there in that chair. I'd walk past and shove him. And, or I would, um, I tried muscling up his hair. I mean, it was pretty short. You can't do much damage. So I'd get along and rush up his hair. And so he did the same to me. <laughs> I thought, I won't do that one again. Mind you, it was a chaotic hairstyle at the time, so it probably wouldn't have noticed any difference. But after his surgery, I tried to be a bit more circumspect. You know, I'd find him, he would be standing on his sticks, and I'd get behind him. We weren't going to stop this, you realise. So I'd get behind him and just put my knee into the back of his knee and just push him, just so he knew that I still cared. Because remember, that's male speak for really liking you. And so we carried on with this, this kind of role play that we did. I have never treated anybody else like that, be reassured, you know. Um, and I don't think I've been ever treated like that by any other person. It's unique and different. But as I consider now and I look, I'm going to miss that. I'm really going to miss that. So when you've graduated... And I know you're in another realm that you and I cannot carry on this game that we play anymore. But when you've got to know, this is just hitting the pause button. Because sooner or later, I'm going to graduate too. And although you were there before me, and you'll have a bit of home advantage, I know that heaven is a place of much fun and laughter. There's a lot of hilarity and I'm quite convinced because we know the nature of God. He loves lots of practical jokes. So when this is not the end of the game, this is a to be continued. Hi, Rima, my friend. Hi, Rima. Thanks, honey. Um, Pastor Dale. At least I get shoved, yeah, unless I'm a pushover, that's right. Finally this afternoon, and with the last words, I'm going to call on Wynn's son, Ozzy. It's been a great joy getting to know you, my brother. And uh, just in the, as we met, and it was slightly formal, and um, we've gone past the handshakes and the awkward hongies, because, you know, I'm white, and... Um, uh, and uh, and we got a hug the other day, and I just uh, felt so warm, and and I uh, so appreciated you in the house with us, and and I want to welcome you uh, to speak of your father and on behalf of your father this afternoon, Oti. Pagarara Titiro Kiroma Titiro Kiroto Titiro Kiraro Ariatura Mesana Papa Okoro Tirangatira Ariki the Ta on the Mato Tipuna to the Ta to Ariki Ariki Roto to Fenoa or Papa Tunuku Pagoro Mai Ha Po Nui Pagoro Mai Porto Tuka, Maria Turaipa. Kia ora koutou. Uh, I'm the oldest son, Richard Oti Murray. 
and my uh, brothers and sisters here. <coughs> well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, family and friends for the support that we've, that we've been that uh, we've been given. Well, this is a funny thing. My father's always tried to get me to church and um, he's finally succeeded. <laughs> Good on you, Dad. I'll give you a bit of, uh, bit of history on Dad. Um, Dad was born in Kaitaia, 1941, 4th of January. Oh, 3rd of January, sorry. His father was uh, Steve Tumurai Murray, and his mother was Sarah Murray. He was actually brought up by his um, grandparents. His grandfather was uh, Tioti Rapihana, and his grandmother was uh, Rihu Taiti Mononui. His grandfather was a member of the Ratna Hai, or the Ratna Church. And he was a Apotoroa in um, the Kaitai region, and his grandmother was a Matakete from up that way. Uh, he was actually brought up in a small fuddy which consisted of a corrugated iron uh, chimney and it would have been probably about 15 foot by 15 foot square with a corrugated iron roof. It had an earth floor and I remember going up there with dad when I was um, young and we used to always go back there and he'd be, first thing he'd do would be talking to Nanny, Nanny Rehu. She passed away quite a few years before that and he'd always go up there talk to her. Um, his fondest memory of her is that she is the most uh, gentle gentle and uh, kind of woman he ever met in his entire, entire life. Uh, <coughs> yeah, Dad was a horse thief, he, um, he won't deny that. But everybody in the region was, it was uh, just a the thing that you would do, you get to point A to point B, just go out the paddock, find a horse, and away you go. Uh, 1953, that would have been about 13, 14, and a uh, truck pulled up beside the marae there, and they said, oh, you boys want a job. The, that time, Dad was uh, 13 years old. And he goes, oh, yeah? So him and a few of his mates jumped on this truck, and that was the, for the NZDD back at the time. So he shoots inside, tells his uh, grandmother, I'm just going to go away for a while. She didn't realise he was telling the truth. So on the truck he goes, away he goes, away he goes to Auckland. And it's quite funny because when he arrived at Auckland, he'd never seen um, street lights before, never seen power, never seen running water. So when they arrived there at the camp, they spent the whole night flicking the switches off and on, <laughs> trying to work out what's going on here. The following morning, they were up and um, they were having a drink of water. And uh, the foreman at the time came out and he goes, what the hell are you boys doing? Because they're actually in the Whanipaku having a drink of water. They've never seen one before. The next day they got issued um, boots which they'd never ever worn before. So you got four little Māori boys from Pukipoto, got their first pair of boots, work clothes, and I thought, this is Christmas. While Dad was there, by the age of 15, he became a actually qualified electrician. And the way he achieved this was he was uh, working as a labourer with some old uh, English gentlemen that were wiring up a substation in Auckland. And what Dad used to do is he used to watch these guys every day, and they'd be wiring it up, wiring it up. So what he would do is, when they used to go for a smoker, he would sneak around the back, because he had identical panels at the back, and he wired it up identical what they'd done. The foreman at the time had a look at what was going on, he goes, he thought she had to do this. He goes, oh, I've just been watching these fellas. So within two years, he was a fully qualified electrician at the age of 15. From there, he um, moved into the, with, the, with the NZD, and that's when they started the um, hydroelectric projects throughout New Zealand. And Dad became a linesman. He travelled the length of the country as a linesman. 
every time I go past the pylon, I go, oh yeah, Dad probably built that one. And I'd say probably 70% of the pylons that are up in New Zealand, he actually was in control of the of the resurrection of those of those pylons. He was uh, quite inspirational in, in the things that he'd done. What he one of his eyes, his ideas was when they're doing the Marapodi uh, transmission line through, they had no way of getting concrete up to the to the pylons. So he said to his boss, oh, why don't you get a helicopter? So they actually, first time they used to chop at a kibble and concrete on the pylons through uh, the Marapodi line. One of the stories he told me that um, used to happen when they had the camp there at Lake Marapodi was they get up in the morning and it's the first one up. All you hear is bang! Because they all took their rifles up there because they'd be dead just walking around past the camp. So every time they came out on break, they'd be coming out with a heap of venison and unfortunately quite a large number of pigeons. And uh, the, p the pigeon episode kept on going for quite a number of years. Because they used to go and down and see, uh, it was old Harold Ashwell, he used to have a place out at Tuatapiti. He used to go into his uh, block, it was Dad and uh, Bill Matthews with the 22s. They came out with about 200 kiriru. But what they used to do was they used to go around all the kaumatuas and queers around, around south and drop them off, give them all a kai. And there was one thing um, when I was young and at Winton was seeing all the lions when they would go out for a dive, they'd bring back a heap of kai moana, whatever they had, but they would always take it to the old people first. And that's just the way, um, he, that's the way he was brought up. Um, 63, Dad was in Roxburgh. And he was um, yeah, doing lines there. 67, he was in the camp at Winton. Running the transmission lines. He's, what happened was he uh, got promoted up and he was actually running the installation of all the um, pylons as well as managing the camps. Then he moved to uh, Mosgill and Twizel. Now, 83 to 88, he's like um, all of us, we uh, sometimes lose our ara, lose the pathway. So Dad had a bit of a, bit of a break from everything until he found himself again. And then in uh, 1990, he moved back to Invercargill. He, plus, oh, he was also uh, managing the Mosman Hotel. And I've got, got some fond memories up there. There's um, Julian and Josh and Courtney were there. Well, Dad had a, a good way, of, a unique way of babysitting. He brought a pony for Courtney, and his idea was, oh yeah, throw her on the horse, she'll be right. So he'd take her out there, plonk on the horse, and uh, go and do his work. Um, yeah. 90s to 93, Dad started working with uh, social services. And he started uh, with Tahurahi. He did a lot of work in the prison, all voluntary. He had a shot at uh, the Tuatara backpackers. I'm pretty sure a lot of you will remember that. Uh, he's come over to us in Australia a couple of times and um, heard all the family and it's, it's been great. It's just unfortunate that we're all together this time for this. But, uh, He's taught me a lot of things along the way. Um, one of the most things is, uh, big things, you've got to show respect. And if possible, help someone else that's in need. And that's uh, one of the biggest things that's impacted on me over the years. So Dad, safe travels. And uh, hopefully I won't catch up to you too soon. I get there. Ah, <laughs> 
We're just going to uh, close the service uh, in a few moments and uh, we're going to sing a song and, um, and then we're going to, I'm going to ask you to remain standing and then we're going to pray and uh, then we're going to take Wynn on his final journey to the Eastern Cemetery this afternoon. Word of God in John 14 says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, Jesus said. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If it were not so, I would have told you, and where I am going, I prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I'm going to come, and I'm going to get you, so that you will always be with me and where I am, and you know the way where I'm going. And I'm always amused by this. There's always one in every crowd, and his name was Thomas. And he goes, Lord, where are you going? And how do we get there? And Jesus looks at him and he says those words that many of us know, even if we're not great churchgoers. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He whoever, believe, whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And today we affirm the Christian faith that death is not the end, it's the beginning. It's a phase all of us, it's a metamorphosis, if you like, that all of us goes through. From crawling around as a caterpillar, so to speak, to being able to spread our wings and to be able to find something of the beauty of God that we have not yet experienced, but only can imagine. I said this on Sunday when we remembered our friend Wynne, and I'll say it again, that we think we know. We may have ideas about what eternity looks like, but the Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the imagination of man what God has prepared for those who love him. And so I rest on that, because there's great imagination and great creativity in this world. There's all kinds of people. In New Zealand, we have Peter Jackson imagining all kinds of things, but even in his world, he cannot imagine what God said, because this is outside of the realm. And so there is something for all of us to look forward to. And so I encourage you, as we say our farewells to win, and as we sing, and as we stand together, that Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's stand together, shall we? And we'll sing these last few songs. And then I want you to remain standing at the end of those songs.
Father, we come and we thank you for your presence. 
It's true that as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that we will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Lord, you anoint our head with oil. You fill our cup, not half empty or half full, but our cup overflows. And Father, today we lift up the family. We lift up Ginny. And we pray for her. Pray, Father, for the Morton family. We bless them. And we thank you for them. We pray that you would journey with them and through this time. And we thank you. Father, I want to thank you for Oti and his brothers and sisters and the family that have come from the north to the south and have spread across this nation and around the world. And Father, we bless them. We pray that you would go before them and create ways for each of these families, that you come behind them and guard them, overshadow them, undergird them in all of their ways. And we lift up our brother Wynn to you and we thank you for him. We thank you for our memories. We thank you for the great places that we've walked together with him. It may have been brief. It may have been profound. But today, Lord, we release our brother. We will not forget him, but we release him to you because you have prepared a way for him and a place for him. In Jesus' name. Amen.